Thanks, you guys, so much for having me back here at Oklahoma. It's actually been a little while since I've been here. I was in town for the Tornado Summit and the Weather Fest just before that. But I actually spent about 17 years continuous enrollment here at the University of Oklahoma. I started in 1998 and then finally finished grad school in 2015. But I definitely do not recommend that pace. Uh, I did go through a certain, uh, I was storm chasing quite a bit. And then uh, toward the end, it really started to grind to a halt in my research because I was trying to storm chase and then do the Discovery Channel show and also do research at the same time. And a lot of times I was driving down the road in the Dominator with no air conditioning, tried to write my uh, dissertation. And then next thing I know, I was rearranging the same paragraph for about six months after that. And then, uh, but I definitely would recommend uh, better budgeting your time and focusing on uh, school right now. And uh, I certainly do have uh, learned some things along the way trying to pursue a career in storm chasing. So I'll share a lot of those, uh, some things that I learned and a lot of the mistakes that I made uh, that, so you guys can avoid uh, taking those type, types of paths. And I'll show a lot of videos uh, through the talk as well because I'm not that great of a speaker, so I like to show a lot of videos uh, the whole entire time as well. And I'll show you videos from inside tornadoes, uh, the data that we collected in there, uh, the evolution of the Dominator storm chasing vehicles as well. Uh, some of my original videos that are pretty embarrassing and I normally wouldn't play them uh, during a talk, but they all started right here um, at, at the University of Oklahoma. And I'll also talk about my interest in suction vortices too, and that's the video that I'll start out showing you first, uh, the one in 2007 in Northwest Oklahoma on the same day as the Greensburg, Kansas tornado. There was an LP supercell in Ellis County that put down a tornado and it barely produced any rain, just the occasional softball sized hailstone and then a beautiful elephant trunk on the back side of it. Uh, but Joel and I were chasing that tornado back then and we were so close to it that we could see suction vortices spinning around inside even though the tornado was only about uh, 50 meters across. But I'll uh, tell you how I got interested in uh, storm chasing. We all probably got interested in weather the same way. It just kind of happened, I'm sure. So it's great though that we all share the same interest for weather here. And, I'll show you a lot of uh, videos of storm chasing, but keep in mind that this is an example. All of these are mainly examples of how not to stay safe around severe weather, which <laughs> I think can be just as educating as showing you how to stay safe. So this was in Northwest Oklahoma in 2007. So this is a north-south road and the tornado is going north-northeast. So this approach is not ideal here. <laughs> but you always got to be aware of your direction. As meteorologists, we probably always are anyway. But this is right in the vault region between the tornado and the rain shaft. And you can see here it's just a solid vortex all the way up. And that's the condensation right there. So you really don't know how much wider the tornado extends beyond the condensation. This is the last time Joel let me drive, too. <laughs> We're about to switch here. <laughs> See the kink just above the ground, too, in the main vortex? That's caused by the friction, uh, the interaction of the vortex with the friction of the earth there. But you'll see that on a much smaller scale once it splits up into individual suction vortices. <laughs> well, Joe kept backing up when I opened the door and he almost broke my legs there, but. <laughs> you can see so much fine scale structure from this distance too that can't see otherwise. And one thing tornadoes like to do is they like to make a left-hand turn. So we're lucky that this tornado didn't take a farther left-hand turn and come back toward the road like they did on the Dodge City Day in 2016. So you always kind of have to be aware of, of that left-hand turn that they like to execute. 
The beautiful thing about a tornado that's different from humans is it's not trying to come after you. It's just doing its thing. But as long as you stay out of its path, you'll be okay. But you'll see it split into suction vortices here in a second. I'll fast forward a little bit. <laughs> so this is when it starts to interact with the friction of the earth. And that creates what's called cross isobaric flow. So if you can imagine a, a tornado in cyclostrophic balance, the balance between the centrifugal outgoing force and the pressure gradient force in toward the low pressure. And so when you decrease those winds just a little bit, it throws it out of balance and they go in toward the low pressure, cross isobars, and that's what splits it into these multiple vortices. You can see them there barely with the naked eye. But when you slow them down, you can see that they have a pretty distinct structure. Just hear the raw empathy there. Watch this tree. And that one didn't even experience any of the upper vertical velocities. It seemed like it was mostly horizontal. I think there's a lot of upward motion in, in the closer to the center of that tornado. But again, that's just the condensation. So you can see that debris go way out from the tornado, and it's going in closed rotation. So this tornado could even be you know, an eighth of a mile wide, even though it looks like a rope. So it's pretty reckless to assess a tornado shape based on just the condensation like that. It could look like a rope and be a wedge. All tornadoes could be wedges. <laughs> <laughs> and so I grew up in Michigan, but like everybody here, I was always interested in uh, extreme weather and severe weather. But the first storms that I chased were lake effect snow squalls just to the south of Grand Rapids. And I had a 1985 Plymouth Reliant back then. That was my first storm chasing vehicle. And I would sneak out of the house and then drive south into the lake effect snow bands and almost got myself in trouble a few times. But I realized pretty early the need for a winter weather safety kit when you go out there. But then I, I, I was in Science Olympiad as well, and I collected insects for about 15 years, uh, mainly specialized in moths and also scarab beetles. And then I caught an Eastern Hercules beetle at about age 16, and that was it, really, for insects. After that, I decided to follow my true passion all along, which was meteorology, and I was also into reptiles and amphibians, like so many meteorologists seem to be here as well, but uh, Science Olympiad was kind of my thing. I didn't go through puberty until about 25 years old. <laughs> so, and I came to uh, the University of Oklahoma in 1998, and I saw my first tornado a few months after that, October 4 of 98, which was a pretty substantial outbreak for October standards in Oklahoma, actually one of the biggest ever. And I didn't know what I was doing. I learned how to storm chase the wrong way. And my friend Charlie Floyd was one of the few people that had a vehicle freshman year, so we all piled in there. Uh, while well, this first tornado was just he and I, and I, I, we, a huge shelf cloud was approaching us, and it had some eddies on the leading edge, and I didn't know what I was doing then, so I told Charlie we got to abandon the vehicle, and we got underneath an overpass and then got sprayed by 80 mile an hour straight line winds and rain and got completely soaked, but I realized I really didn't have to get out of the vehicle at that time with a shelf cloud approaching as well, but... And then we drove south, and I knew that the tornado was on the south side of the storm, and we kept going through um, hail core, rain core hail, and then uh, rain free base, and then finally looked to the east near Perry, Oklahoma, and saw two tornadoes right next to each other that I still think they were just smaller tornadoes south along the flanking line with a bigger one off to the left that I, the rain concealed my view. Uh, but that was the first uh, tornado. And then um, I saw the May 3rd, 99 tornado, freshman year, and I'll play that video a little bit later. But since that time, uh, there's a, I'll show you also uh, some things that we had to do as storm chasers to make ends meet and uh, do storm chasing for a living, which is difficult. I don't know if I would recommend this path for <laughs> anybody. Maybe do it as kind of a side, side project is always good because you always have to have that in place, but definitely is a high variance lifestyle. But I've had to e evolve to other different types of weather as well. Uh, most recent obsession are these debris plugs in the desert southwest. So the parent thunderstorm will be about 50 miles away, and then you wait for hours in these dry creek beds like this. And I met up with an expert up there named David Rankin, and he has been doing this since he was little and has developed a model that overlays radar hourly precipitation on topographic maps, and he's been able to track these debris plugs. So I'll show you this video here. Let's 
this could be the future of storm chasing here. <laughs> so this is just east of Kanab, Utah. And they've had a lot of uh, debris plugs as well recently off of those burn scars in California. And so I started targeting burn scars after this as well. But this one was not generated by a burn scar. It was formed by a thunderstorm over Bryce Canyon. And it traveled about 40 or 50 miles away from the thunderstorm source region. And it collected all of this debris. And the debris plug at the front goes a little bit slower than the rest of the flood due to friction. It's a big gyre kind of on the front in general. And then it allows all the rest of the flat, mini flash floods to catch it. So it keeps growing as it goes, goes downstream. In this case, it goes toward Lake Powell, which is part of a dammed up section of the Colorado River. But before they dammed up all the west, they just used to have mega floods that go all the way to the Pacific Ocean just like this. And I was able to run along the front edge of it as well. I can show you that. This is kind of what I do for AccuWeather here. <laughs> I, what's that? Need a wrestle of bears. No, I practiced that. That thing was moving at three miles an hour. So I actually practiced that maneuver over and over again. Because if you make one misstep, you know, you could have big problems and you never want to become a victim of a storm. But I was worried about the mountain lion situation. I've always felt like, you know, in Colorado, I do a lot of trail running. I'm worried about a mountain lion attack. And that one person had to choke one here recently. But I like wildlife, so. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, I'm obsessed with these floods, so you guys may not be quite as into these. But I'll show you another one that uh, intercepted here at night. Nocturnal flood intercept is the most dangerous kind of flood intercept. But I was with an expert, David Rankin, here that had chased a bunch. And we had to go about 40 miles into the grand staircase here. He was leading me on this one road that goes into there. And this is called Last Chance Wash. And he said, run. And uh, I realized we had to get out of there. But you can see it. You can smell these floods coming like an hour in advance. You can hear like a dull roar in the distance. Yeah, you can smell them. They smell like earth, almost like how you'd like to. You know, like I used to like to eat paste and stuff when I was in school. <laughs> so it almost makes it smells good, almost like that. <laughs> But this is just a side lobe of the flood here that kind of came up uh, the road, but the main flow is down there. And he said every wash is different, so the flood travels at a different speed, and this flood happened to be going really quickly. It is kind of sad, the amount of timber in there, and a lot of it does look like it's a uh, human cut. You gotta wonder why that's happening like that. But before they had dams, they were just... <clears throat> You know, mega, mega floods that go all the way to the Pacific. But now the Colorado River doesn't even run to the Pacific. It's completely dry down there. So back to the tornadoes. This is from 2013. This is the Dominator 3 in action here. You'll see Mike Scantlin a lot in this one. This is the El Reno day here as well. Un much larger multiple vortex tornado. And this is May 19, 2013. So I used to chase for Channel 4, too, back then for about four years. You'll see a lot of the upward motion here in the suction vortices, too. This is the one that developed right near Edmond, Oklahoma, and then crossed 235. And that's the Bennington tornado the day before El Reno. Potato gun. <laughs> 
There's more of the suction vortices too. That's when it's crossing 235 there. And watch the tree going straight up. The reason I included this is just because it's important to be passionate about what you're doing. Uh, that's why every, everybody's here, so we don't have to worry about our passion. We're all doing what we love, and it helps us get through all those math classes and everything, too. And don't know if it's good for your health, but this was back in the uh, Discovery Channel days in uh, 2008. So we did Discovery Channel for four years, and this was before we built the Dominator, which I'll talk about the evolution of those. But uh, the first vehicle that I purchased from a bank that was worth over about $300 was a Chevy Tahoe in 2008. And a year later, we turned it into Dominator 1, and I never told the bank or the insurance agency. <laughs> but this is the first couple chases here with Dominator 1 when we tried to deploy a probe back then. Yeah, in 2008, there was a big outbreak in southeast Kansas and northeast Oklahoma near Pitcher. The, the warm front looked big, but then the dry line had a bunch, a bunch of supercells. The wrap nailed it, though. See, they put a little 2007 in there, too. <laughs> well, you know when your voice sounds a little uh, different to you and you hear it for the first time and you're not a big fan of it? That takes that whole phenomenon to a whole new level. <laughs> I had tr trouble watching that afterward. But this is the evolution of my storm chasing vehicle. That's the Reliant up there. And, and then... Uh, I had several vehicles that were held together by duct tape, including the Chevy Lumina on the upper right. That one I did about 25,000 miles without changing the oil, and then eventually it blew up on us. We were coming back, back from Minnesota. In the middle of the night, all these alarms started going off. The interior filled with smoke. Uh, the brakes gave out, and I uh, had to abandon it on the side, of the side of the road, the Lumina. And then those are the three dominators there. And those were motivated by that tornado in 2007 with all the suction vortices and also the vertical motion to the winds. And our plan was just to have an SUV with Lexan armor on the outside so we could get really close to it, be protected by debris, and then shoot projectiles into the tornado. Uh, but the person that built the Dominators uh, was a, a friend of mine uh, that worked in the golf course uh, maintenance business as well, but he built race cars on the side up in Michigan, and he's the only person we knew that could build them. Kevin Barton is his name. And uh, he built all three of those uh, out of his garage up in, in Michigan. And so he went from being a golf course mechanic to building our, our Dominator vehicles. And what you're supposed to do is test the vehicle out first and then intercept the tornadoes. But we intercepted the, uh, the tornadoes first. And then here's the test, though, the year after. And this is uh, as part of the Mythbusters shoot. But we uh, tried to simulate the closest that we could to a strong tornado. But the problem behind a jet like this is it's purely straight line winds. Even though they're 300 miles an hour, you really can't simulate the convergence that you see in tornadoes on the really small scales, especially those suction vortices that are maybe a few feet across with one wind you know, going at 400 or 500 miles an hour and then a, few, a meter over to the left, it's going that same speed the other way. The shear along that is uh, impossible to replicate. But for Mythbusters, it made for good television. So I went to northern Michigan where it was about five degrees out. And we tested regular vehicles as well. And they went flying through the air like 100 feet. We tested Illumina, which is just like the one that I drove for years. And when you have wind going underneath the vehicle and getting forced up and over rapidly, it creates a negative pressure perturbation above the vehicle. So you can even see the Dominator bouncing a little bit. But when you eliminate the wind underneath, you don't have nearly as much uplift. So that's why a regular vehicle get lofted or 
if you're driving down the road and you get hit by a tornado and you're not stopped, it's a lot easier to eject a vehicle that's already in motion too. So if you ever do find yourself in a bad spot, I always think it's best just to bury the vehicle in the ditch because you maximize the friction underneath the vehicle and get as low as possible. But I definitely don't, wouldn't abandon the vehicle. I got in a, a difficult spot in 2017 with my vehicle in the path of the Canton tornado. And uh, I kind of waited a little too long and I sh should have turned my vehicle around. I was by myself and had a probe and a 360 camera. So I was overwhelmed with that, trying to live stream too and do AccuWeather reports with a tornado about to hit us and then Extreme Tornado Tours came and they got out of the path of it too. And then I realized that my vehicle was still pointing at the tornado. And I tried to drive through the ditch, but then right when I was in the ditch, the traction control kicked in and it lost power and I fell into the ditch. I was looking up at the edge of the tornado and I had already waited too long and I kept thinking that this, you know, this is not good, obviously. And I was gonna try one time to get out of the ditch and if that didn't work, then I was planning to run as far as I could to the south and maybe find you know, a, a drainage pipe or something along the way or just get as far away from possible from the core flow. But I don't know what I would have done, but I tapped the gas and then it just pops my vehicle out and I, the escape route was to the southeast and I had parallel winds that were coming into my face as the tornado was hitting me and these trees were getting lofted and I double tapped the record button on my camera too so I didn't have that and didn't deploy the probe or fire up the 360 camera but barely made it away and then looked behind me and saw the tornado go by. But the scary thing is, is if you're in the path of a tornado and one thing goes wrong then you can so easily get hit by it which is why I always try to do more of a, a hook slice maneuver and then approach the tornado from the up sheer side because you could always stop and allow it to move off into the distance as an escape route. But I'll show you some hook slice maneuvers a little bit later. But quickly, uh, I want to show you the Dominator 3. Uh oh, that one doesn't seem to work. This is a uh, Dominator 3 rocket test, so we're hoping to deploy this this year. But I'll, I'm setting all this stuff up for a little bit later. Show you some of the data we collect. So then the parachute will pop out, and then most of the wind is trying to go in toward the low pressure anyway, at least prior to the tornado occlusion. And so then that would carry our trackable uh, instrument sensors into the tornado. And we did this back in 2009, so I'll show you some video of that as well, but then the FAA came after me. <laughs> and I shut that down pretty quickly. And one uh, issue with funding research on your own is it, that it gets real expensive pretty quickly. And so once you run out of resources, you realize how difficult it is to keep doing research. So that's why I'd always recommend getting involved with a government funded project. There are plenty of them around here at at OU and also universities. Oh, I mean, OU is the best place to be for this. But now I'll show you visit, uh, video from 1999. This is one of my first tornadoes. And there is some pretty embarrassing audio in here. But what we also witnessed just after this tornado developed, and this was the May 3rd, 99 F5 uh, near Cyril area, a little east of there. And we first saw the dark side that these tornadoes leave behind just after this. Seems like back then I would just kind of piece together words that I thought made sense in all the videos. But I know looking back, I could see a lot of the structure, and I wish I. You know, ch could rechase many of these and kind of knew what a lot of the, the base supercell structure is. You have the wall cloud there, the tornado forming. And May 3rd, 99 was so textbook with the clear slot coming around and the whole occluded cylinder up. Those are the Doppler on wheels are here at, at OU. Uh, we had barely ever seen a tornado and so I can't stress enough to make sure you go with someone that knows what they're doing. Let me talk to the Extreme Tornado Tours folks. So you guys give out free tours to all OU students. 
<laughs> I got to fast forward through some of this. You guys can't hear that. <laughs> but you can see the cylinder above in that clear slot punching in. I just didn't know how textbook it was. And you could see the whole RFE looping all the way around. There were funnels that were forming along the flanking line. I don't think I've ever seen such a perfectly sculpted storm, too, at low levels in you know, 20 years being out there. It was just perfect, sharp edges to it. Maybe on the super outbreak, but when all the ingredients are in place, the storms become so efficient at producing tornadoes. That was Harold Peterson, if you guys know him, Dr. Peterson. <laughs> and so we lost visual of it, and then next thing you know, we were in the path of it when we came through this grove of trees. And we were in a soft top geo tracker here. Five of us were freshmen and meteorologists packed in that vehicle. And we decided to abandon the geo tracker. This was before all the research that came out, which uh, brought the wind, uh, wind tunnel theory. I still think, you know, if you were, have a choice, you know, do you get it way up into those girders? Sometimes it's better than just standing in the middle of the open. But there you can see the geo tracker. This, there's a lot of errors throughout this talk, but I was 18 years old here. But what I would have done is stayed with the vehicle and probably went up a quarter mile because it was moving a little bit across our field of view. <laughs> so they were fleeing it. And I remember seeing the news helicopters too when we were first approaching this tornado. There were helicopters all around the storm. And I thought that was the craziest thing. Well, there are families up there as well that were not doing too well. But one thing about a tornado too is just the way that it rotates. It almost always look like, looks like it's coming back toward you. And it was kind of right during the path when it took a little left-hand turn there. Decided to run down this road. <laughs> yeah, it gets embarrassing there at the end. <laughs> but then right after that, we drove through the damage, and there were horses wandering in the road, and people emerging from their homes with injuries. And then right away, that excitement of seeing the tornado shifted to a whole different emotion and and then now I'm going to run through a few videos uh, of my favorite ones from 2018 and then I'll show you the data that we collected in some of those dominator intercepts from dominator one to dominator three I also show a uh, hurricane Michael footage and some data we collected inside hurricane Harvey I talk a little bit about extreme tornado tours tornadovideos.net too but one thing about storm chasing is it's, there's, things are so rapidly evolving at all times that you kind of have to look far ahead to see where everything's going. And I think eventually every person will probably have their own app that will provide you know, forecasts of certain reliability or you know, updates on their storm chasing. Or I could see it kind of going that way where every single person has their own network with less dependence on kind of the main, they're trying to keep a stranglehold on everything. But I think that's probably how it will evolve. But this one, now with uh, AccuWeather, instead of using the Dominator, so a lot of times I'm in a rental car, and I'll get the $20 insurance, and then sometimes it gets a lot of hail damage, and I've been through several uh, rental cars a year now recently. But this one here I was chasing in Cheyenne and had to go off-road a little bit on a road that wasn't on the map, and it ended up popping my tire. And so I had to decide between changing the tire and missing the tornado or driving on the rim for 15 miles and seeing this tornado. And you can always use the wind direction to tell when the tornado is going to wobble. And so right now, the wind's northwesterly going in toward that vortex. 
That would normally tell you that it's going to push a little bit off to the east. But I was watching the wind shift back over to the east, and they even started developing an easterly component when I was due west of the tornado. And that was kind of a signal that the, it was coming back at me, and it was kind of wobbling within a larger tornado cyclone within it, and a, you know, the mesocyclone here. You'll be able to see the wind change. And this one doesn't have multiple vortices. It's probably because the tornado is not strong enough to uh, when it interacts with the friction of the earth to cause those winds to go in toward the low pressure. And then when that happens, it'll split up into the individual ones. I wasn't worried about my spot, but I was worried about the people at uh, those uh, home, homes getting hit. I was happy with my position here. But I'm, I'm talking to myself here, too, so. Yeah. There are a few more later, too, that you can see that were cows. And they reported some missing, too, from their farmland there. But the impact on cattle really is terrible with these tornadoes because they're penned in the fence there and they can't escape. So I moved to Colorado in the last few years, and I learned a lot about the, these high plains. So I live at 7,800 feet, and the strength of the cold frontal passage in late morning determines whether you target Wyoming or Colorado. So if it's a relatively weaker frontal passage and it doesn't knock over my plant, then uh, I target northeast Colorado. And if it's a stronger cold front and it knocks it down, then I go up to Wyoming and it works. And I think that's just because it, the winds only have a chance to get easterly further north in a stronger cold front. You have the northerlies. And then a, a person emerged from their destroyed home here, and they had two Alaskan huskies, so I allowed them to take shelter in my rental car, and they got in the back seat and then just destroyed the whole interior in the back. <laughs> but then I returned the rental, and they started clapping for me because they had so many hail claims during this series of days in the high plains that they're Im impressed by the damage. <laughs> but most of the high plains are post-frontal events, so they're a little bit different out closer to the Rockies. You have to have a cold frontal passage usually, and then you play behind the front when the wind shifts back over to easterly, and then the clouds clear and you get destabilization behind the front. They're a lot different than the dry line setups you get here in the plains. And because of the way they're set up, a lot of times you get a kilometer of due easterlies all the way up to about a kilometer. So if you look at the, tr the traditional indices in the high plains of you know, zero to one kilometer shear, it doesn't really show a very strongly sheared environment because you have easterlies similar in magnitude all the way up. But then between about a kilometer and three kilometers, they flip around to southwesterly or even more. And so you get a ton of shear through zero to three kilometers. So that's why I always recommend to use those indices in the high plains rather than your standard parameters here. And there's definitely an overemphasis on CAPE as well. I think that if you have low enough cloud bases and you have a lot of shear, then that's, that's really all you need. When we were in school here, everybody would say, I'm not chasing anything with about 3,000 CAPE. But you'd miss a lot of tor tornadoes if you do that. So we also ch uh, chase hurricanes for AccuWeather now. And there are several different options you could do for storm chasing. You could take the research route and um, go to grad school and get involved in research projects. Uh, you could also go the media route. You know, there's some uh, media chasers here. Gage is with Channel 5. I used to chase for Channel 4. The problem is that they make you stay in the state. And so if it looks good in Kansas, then uh, sometimes you have to risk your, your job and go to Kansas. But you could also do the media route. You could go independent and try to generate ad revenue. But I, I definitely recommend staying in school the whole entire time and make you know, be a scientist as your primary objective and then storm chase on the side and you never know where it could take you. But this is Hurricane Michael, my, my new Subaru. And my dog Gizmo was with me, so I kind of stayed out of the uh, real intense part. I was in the western eye wall here and hurricanes are a lot different to chase than tornadoes because you're immersed in the conditions. So you have to bring survival gear a lot of times. And if you do have to get rescued, that's probably the end of your storm chasing career. So you definitely don't ever want to call for rescue. So you always got to be prepared and have plenty of supplies that you bring from outside of the damage zone. 
But the good thing is, is that a lot of the winds are unidirectional until you get a tornado, tornado like eddy embedded within the uh, eye wall. And there can also be projectiles. Well, that's why you're, the, the biggest uh, dan danger in these winds are flying debris, because the wind by itself really isn't that dangerous, but when you start getting debris loading and sheet metal and... So my plan now is to build some type of an armored vehicle that would allow us to get to the eye and still be safe, but then can also float. So if floodwaters come in, we could, like one of those Jeeps that drives from land instantly to water where you don't have to slow down. I was thinking something like that that's also armored that could float, go into the water, back out on the land. If people needed help from roofs, we could pull them off the roofs and give us some ravi ravioli or something. Because that's what we always bring for these hurricanes, the Chef Boyardee. <laughs> but hurricanes are a totally different experience. I think my favorite thing to chase now are the, debris the fl flash floods and debris plugs, though. But this is my science mission plan that I presented uh, to AccuWeather a few years ago, and they, they said no, basically, I uh, said in 2018, just because it's a little too extensive, but still, I'm going to try to deploy it to, for 2019. Still working on them uh, pretty hard, but the plan is basically to get as many data points as possible uh, inside the tornado. You can see an array of ground-based probes there in the path. I photoshopped some of those suction vortices in there with the kink just above the ground, too, so you can tell that the suction vortex is interacting with the friction of the Earth when it gets that kink just above the ground like that. Is Dr. Fiedler still here? So he uh, did a lot of simulations of these suction vortices that I'll show in some future slides, too, and he showed that the strongest winds occur at that kink all the way to the ground, and that's not a good thing because then those winds are reaching the surface and causing damage, and that's why you'll have one house that'll be untouched or the one next door completely damaged, and it's because of the, uh, those suction vortices. And so when you take a tornado and then split it into four to five different suction vortices, it doesn't really lose its angular momentum, but concentrates it into those different vortices. So you could have winds ramp up on the really small space and time scales inside those. And I'd also love to have close range radar and I think that, and also a network of drones, uh, once we get the FAA on board, I still have to pass my, my part 107 exam. But I had a lot of big goals like this and then encountered some fi financial hardship over the last few years. And so now I've been in survival mode, but then once we kind of get back going again, this would be the ultimate plan. Because I'm not the kind of person that saves up for retirement. <laughs> and here is one of our uh, airplane deployments from 2009. And this is the one that got us in trouble with the uh, FAA. <laughs> this is one of the first time, this is kind of gave rise to the part 107 exam too eventually. But we had a, a drone that had a 14 foot wingspan and it had a parachute deployment device as well in the underside and so we just press a button and then it would drop parachute probes out of it. And this is one of the few things that we did that actually worked. And so our plan, we were trying to intercept this tornado at the same time with the dominator to measure surface wind speed. And we had a radar that pointed in the vertical that measures the updrafts and downdrafts in the tornado. And then we'd have this plane flying around dropping parachute probes into the inflow region. Our problem was never getting hardware into the tornado, it was just having sensors that really work properly. It's amazing, too, how laminar the uh, environment is around the mesocyclone. And there's the tornado forming. <laughs> You'll see the parachutes pop out. But one thing I learned is that when a tornado occludes, by definition, it's getting choked off from the inflow of the storm, and that's as the sinking air wraps around the inflow air and traps it in a vortex. So we realized from this just how difficult it is to penetrate that sheath of sinking air that encloses the tornado. That's why you need rockets. You need the propulsion to get through that 
basically a rear flank downdraft, but it cuts through the mesocyclone and then traps that inflow air in the vortex in there. So it's in the process of occluding right there and still touching down. So you've got a narrow window to get probes into that inflow as it streams into the tornado, unless you have propulsion. But now drones are so commonplace, you could just take a network of suicide drones and fly them into the tornado with GPS trackers on them. And I'm sure what that play button is up there. It's kind of scary. But this is all 10 years, nine years ago or so. So you can see that they never quite got inside that sheath of sinking air. See how they'd get knocked down a lot? I think there's a video of it dropping out again. But the landing was always the tough part, and there were a few occasions where the gust front would surge a little south and the plane would still be airborne and they'd have to hop in the vehicle and then fly as they were driving to the south and then eventually land it when they're a safe distance away. These are the rocket probes that we've already discussed. So I'm working with AccuWeather to get some trackable sensors that go into the rocket. And these are those uh, frame captures of the suction vortices that were in the May 4, 2007 tornado that I started at the beginning. And you can see when you slow it down, the kink just above the ground, even on those really small scales of the helical configuration to those vortices. And then those are some uh, captures from Dr. Fiedler's work in 2009, where there's a kink just above the ground, and those orange colors are the lowest pressure, per the biggest pressure perturbations and also the strongest wind speeds. And it shows that with suction vortices, they do extend down to the ground. Since that time, there's been all kinds of with advancements in computer technology now. I know that up at the University of Wisconsin, I know Dr. Wicker uh, here as well are doing all kinds of simulations and they show the same thing that Dr. Fiedler was doing a long time ago too. But you still need to compare what you see in simulations to real life and really what we're missing are the data points right at the ground in terms of the wind speeds. But at least now with close range radar, you can get closer and closer to the tornado and scan the base because with the when you um, are trying to sample the wind speeds of the radar from a standoff range, it goes up at an angle. And so you're measuring the winds above where they're actually impacting the structures and probably even above where it splits into those intense suction vortices. <laughs> 